in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure and blessing to have uh, Matthew have to here that. with us uh, uh, today talking about the apostolic tradition and the importance of the church fathers. Uh, so looking forward to that. Thank you, Matthew. God bless you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. You can kind of see the screen behind me. It's a bunch of words. Um, only for people to follow along. It's flashing, kind of, I don't know, like you're at a disco or something. It's the vibe of the screen. Um, I'm going to talk about apostolic tradition and the importance of the church fathers, as Abuna said. Um, why? Because it's something near and dear to our heart, my heart at least, and it's essentially what all of orthodoxy is built off of. So, the first question, if I'm telling you, um, this is the pillar of orthodoxy, then the question arises of, I suppose, what is orthodoxy? What do we consider the orthodox faith? And possibly, where does it come from? Um, if you attend a Protestant church, they may tell you, uh, you know, they have their themes, one of such being their pillars is sola scriptura, meaning that the faith is completely encompassed by scripture nothing outside of scripture constitutes faith and uh, so much so that you should fear adding something from outside of scripture because you may get something wrong and make um essentially become a liar and create heresy it's, or so it says or, or so they claim um essentially if it's not found within the scripture it's not a part of the faith um what's the orthodox view on this we're going to turn to first scripture because we do rely on scripture but to see what constitutes our faith what constitutes the orthodox church so in luke at the very beginning of his gospel he writes the following in as much as many of as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. That's in the first four verses of Luke. Uh, the screen's messed up, but if you can see it, I bolded out a couple of words there. To write to you an orderly account. When does the church start? Does anybody have an idea of when we say the church, like officially to some extent, starts? It's not in writing. Not in writing in general. When I talk about the Orthodox Church, there's typically an agreed upon starting point. Do you know what that point is? Well, it's like um, where the Orthodox faith is the Orthodox faith. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you're close in years. Maybe take 10 ish away. But in terms of event that occurs is what I was getting at more so than year. Um, essentially, the Pentecost is what we consider the start of the church. And we say, um, essentially, Acts is the book in the Bible that's not yet complete, because Acts is the story of the church, and the church is growing and continuing until today. So the story of the church has not come to a conclusion. But um, we consider the origin of the church to be Pentecost, when the Spirit descends upon the apostles, and then they go and they preach to the world. But the first gospel is written, we think, around the year 68-ish, uh, like give or take a couple of years. Um, so there's this whole period of time between Pentecost and between the writing of the first gospel that there's less of a written account. And this is why Luke at this point is saying to write to you an orderly account. Essentially what this is getting out is um, we've preached these things by word. And we've told you orally the faith. We've told you orally what happened to Christ. But now I'm going to put this down to pen and paper and I'm going to write for you an account. So already in the beginning of Luke, we see some indication that the faith was passed down orally. And if the church started at Pentecost, then the church started without a written word. So it can't necessarily be only scripture is what we rely upon because the church was existent before the forming of scripture. And there's a couple of more verses which highlight this point of oral tradition. Firstly being uh, in 2 Thessalonians 
It's written, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which were taught, whether by word or our epistle. So whether the things we wrote down or whether when we were with you in the church, preaching by word. So it's not, um, it's not exclusively just word or exclusively just the things I've said to you. It's both are taken together. And this is what constitutes the faith as preached by the apostles. And then in John, um, everybody knows this because we always quote it. But at the end of the book of John, it says, and there are also many things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written on them. John 21, 25. So John at the end of his gospel even goes on to say like, everything that Jesus did, I didn't put to pen and paper because if I wanted to, I wouldn't have like the time in my life and I couldn't contain all these things in my book. So clearly Christ is teaching his apostles um, and there are things he's teaching and things he's doing per John that occur outside of scripture in the sense that they were never written down because nobody had the time to write every single thing down. So we now establish that, okay, the Orthodox faith, if we've established the church was around prior to the formal writing of some scriptures, their epistles at the time, but prior to these gospels and all these books being compiled, and it can't be just scripture because we just looked at verses which tell us it's not scripture alone, then the church is scripture plus something else. Uh, it's not just only scripture. St. Irenaeus, he says, um, for him, orthodox tradition is a mosaic of like, you take all these pieces and you put it together and you look at the whole. Um, I'm going to be quoting quite a bit, but it says orthodox tradition is understood to be built upon from many parts, but all together making a single harmonious whole. Um, and that's from a book called the Orthodox Church. But essentially, St. Irenaeus says, you know, it's not just the scripture. It's not just the uh, liturgical rites. It's not just the preaching of word. It's the letters that were written, the writings of the fathers, the scripture. Everything together puts you uh, in a mosaic that if you don't have one of them, you don't have the whole picture of what orthodoxy is. And until you constitute all of them together and are able to look um, from an outward perspective, then that's when you can get the sense of what orthodoxy is. Once you take all of these individual parts and put them as a whole, but each one individually does not constitute the faith. It's only when you take each one and put it together that you get the faith as it was intended to be and handed down by Jesus Christ. And this is just like a, another quote, which exemplifies that it's Timothy where uh, he's more recent. He writes um, a book called the Orthodox church and he's trying to decipher exactly what does tradition mean to him. And this is the conclusion he comes down to. He says the Orthodox church tradition means the Holy Bible. It means the creed. It means the decrees of the ecumenical councils and the writings of the fathers. It means the canons, the service books, the holy icons, etc. In essence, it means the whole system of doctrine ecclesiastical government worship and art which orthodoxy has articulated over the ages he's coming to the same conclusion in these modern times as Irenaeus comes to because uh, the faith remains unchanged he says it's not just this it's every single little thing that we take and we put it together and the bible is central and an important part of the holy tradition probably the most uh, important part of the holy tradition but it's not the whole of it i can't just take the bible and say this is constitutes the entirety of the faith because then i'm missing everything outside of the Bible that was taught to the early Christians. And this is St. John of Damascus. He says, we do not keep the everlasting boundaries which our fathers have set, but we keep the tradition just as we received it. And that's the beauty of orthodoxy that I was getting at. Um, and what we get at at one point in the liturgy when we say as it was, so shall it be from generation to generation, Everything remains completely unchanged from the time of Christ. He passes on to his disciples, passed on to their successors, the bishops, and it continues to get passed down and passed down and passed down and unchanged within the Oriental Orthodox Church um, to give us the faith that we have today perfected and remaining the same as it was handed down by Christ. Um, very kind of meticulously in this quote I've shared on the screen, you can see that tradition is capitalized with uh, capital T. 
as opposed to lowercase t. Um, has anybody ever noticed the distinction between capital T and lowercase t? Uh, people nodding, can you provide me the distinction between capital T and lowercase t? You're willing? Yeah, capital T is, yeah, of the fathers, it's the core tenets of the faith, which if we were to alter, would alter the faith itself. Um, when I say things like Mary is Theotokos, we're not going to change that because it's core tenant of our faith. It's capital T tradition, something we believe in. When I say lowercase t, uh, it's very much so um, cultural, uh, oftentimes cultural or oftentimes uh, to change it wouldn't change the form of the faith like uh, nobody ever had televisions this is a weird example but nobody ever had televisions in the church but now we invented televisions we put them in the church and everybody can follow along that's a lowercase t tradition the fact that the sacrament of matrimony now takes place outside of the liturgy whereas prior the sacrament of matrimony always took place in the middle of a liturgy um is a lowercase t tradition in the sense of we can now move that and it hasn't altered the faith. Um, it's just merely something that's changed that's cultural. Uh, or like the most, uh, I guess, obvious thing is that we play the symbols during our liturgy. If you go to an Ethiopian liturgy, uh, they play the two, they're definitely not called the two-headed drums, but I forget the name of them. So I'm gonna call them the two-headed drums. Bongos, they're kind of like bongos, they're big bongos. Um, and that's essentially because the apostles go out to preach and when they preach they take the faith and they adapt it to whatever culture is there at the time so if in ethiopia you have the drums we're adapting to the drums if in egypt you have people playing cymbals and triangle as their cultural um, norm that's adopted the faith was always taken and adopted to the culture uh, that the people were in without changing those capital t traditions but maybe changing the lowercase t traditions the things that don't alter the faith if we change them Now, um, I'm getting to, we just discussed the apostles preach things we discussed outside of scripture. I discussed how it comes from the time of Christ and remains unchanged till today because the, Christ passes the faith down to his apostles. They pass it down to their bishops. They pass it down. They pass it down all the way up until today from generation to generation. And I'm getting to the point of apostolic succession now. Um, Clement of Rome, uh, the first Pope of Catholicism, he says, um, through countryside and city, the apostles preached and they appointed their earliest converts, testing them by the spirit to be the bishops and deacons of future believers. Nor was this a novelty for bishops and deacons had been written about a long time earlier. Our, apostle knew through our, our apostles knew through our Lord Jesus Christ that there would be strife for the office of bishop. For this reason, Therefore, having received perfect foreknowledge, they appoint, appointed those who have already been mentioned and afterwards added the further provision that if they should die, other approved men should succeed to their ministry. This is his uh, letter to the Corinthians. Now, Clement of Rome, anybody want to take a guess uh, as to when he lived? He's discussing the apostles. Around the year 80. This specific passage is from around the year 80. Um, so he's discussing a time at which, like he's living in the age of the apostles, he's discussing a time at which the apostles are clearly appointing bishops of the church, and we see this in Acts as well, but sometimes we think like bishops are these invention that somehow come in the year 300 when the church grows so large and uh, it becomes the official um, religion of the empire that now bishops are needed, whereas no Clement is saying this being written in the year 80, while the apostles are still alive, they're ordaining bishops to go out and minister to the people. Um, they're ordaining others to partake in the tasks that they were assigned. Um, we see this in Acts with the deacons and um, to offer meals to the widows. So there's clearly an ordination, yes, of deacons and also of bishops. And um, the apostles are appointing their successors after them to maintain the faith that they've taught, which is what Clement is saying here. 
And then he talks about strife for the office of bishop because the apostles, after their departure, uh, there's some argument, at least at some points where people are arguing who ought to be the bishop. So this is something they knew was coming. And that's why he said uh, approved men should succeed to their ministry. Um, uh, much along the same vein, Tertullian, who's considered one of the church fathers, um, says the apostles founded churches in every city from which all the other churches, one after another, derived the tradition of the faith and the seeds of doctrine and are every day deriving them that they may become churches. Indeed, it is on this account only that they will be able to deem themselves apostolic as being the offspring of apostolic churches. Every sort of thing must necessarily revert to its original or its classification. Therefore, the churches, although they are so many and so great, comprise but the one primitive church founded by the apostles from which they all spring. In this way, all are primitive and all are apostolic, which while they are all proved to be one in unity. He's saying we have all of these um, different churches, Antioch, Constantinople, you have Alexandria, you have all of these different churches, but they're all one in unity because there's one church preached of by the apostles. It's not multiple tiny churches, but if you go back, the faith remains constant amongst all of these churches because the apostles all preached the same faith. And he's saying, in order for you to be an apostolic church, there has to be a lineage by which you trace yourself back to the apostles. This is in the year 200. So perhaps this whole verse, which is written in the year 200, becomes so much more relevant after 1581, I want to say, I might be off on the year, when Protestantism takes um, rise. Because um, when Martin Luther makes his decree and he separates from the Catholic Church and he starts Protestantism, then you have this founding of a new church, which no longer has its roots founded in the apostles, where when you try to um, look back at when does this church start, you get to a year 15, whatever the year is. I don't want to give you a false year. Um, so it's not considered apostolic. Whereas if I go to the Coptic Orthodox Church, I can trace the lineage back to St. Mark and ultimately back to Jesus Christ. So when I'm talking about apostolic succession, um, in order for a church to be apostolic, you have to be able to trace your lineage back to Jesus Christ and to the apostles. And this is what I was essentially just saying. I put some points down here that the apostles teach and they pass on these teachings um, to their disciples and those disciples have disciples. And it's this early period of the church that we have the emergence of the fathers. So the first couple of centuries, most emerge in the fourth century, but some even emerge after. And there are some Eastern Orthodox fathers who are also um, holy who come later on and write very foundational um, writings. I'm thinking of like, Gregory Palamas, who's uh, a monk in Mount Athos in the year 12 something. He writes a lot of writings that um, are holy and beneficial, but he comes much later on than these church fathers, um, like Chrysostom, Cyril of Alexandria, um, Athanasius, they all come in the early church centuries. Um, who are the fathers? Are they just people who are well-educated and therefore we ought to rely on them? Are they just people who, I don't know, studied very hard? Um, that's not the case. A lot of them did have, um, a lot of them did have a background in learning, uh, a few of them, I won't say a lot of them, but like uh, Augustine writes a lot, some, um, he writes some foundational teachings, I'll say, but uh, he was formally educated um, because, you know, his father was a pagan and he placed um, a high emphasis on education. Uh, and so did Augustine as he's growing up. But uh, essentially, the church fathers are holy men upon whose writings the church relied and it grew. It's not just the fact that these are like scholars and they're well educated. It's the fact that these are the people who were so holy and had such closeness to Christ, both in their spiritual life, but also uh, a lot of them just from the early days of the church as the faith is just being passed on. So they have the closest relation of Christ uh, time-wise. Like you can think some fathers are 300 years removed compared to us now 2000 years removed, but um, they're both 
close to Christ, yes, linear wise in time, but also in their spiritual life. Um, and their writings deepen the faith. We have fathers who uh, at the councils um, fight against heresy, like Pope Dioscoros, and uh, through this, they develop writings. And then this is just like a flow chart I made as an example of like a father, like Irenaeus is considered um, a church father. He has some writings, not all of them are preserved, like some of them we have some bits of the writings and not others. Um, but like, if you try to link Irenaeus to Christ, um, and this is somewhat debated, but so you have Jesus Christ who has John the disciple, John disciples Polycarp. And then some people say Irenaeus, Polycarp disciples Irenaeus, more so more likely Irenaeus listens to Polycarp speak a lot as he's a young child or speak to some degree. So you have this lineage of Jesus Christ gives a teaching to John who gives it to Polycarp, who then gives it to Irenaeus and Irenaeus then um, writes and he shares this, these writings with uh, the church. So that's what I mean by we can link things back to Jesus Christ. And I think like, I, like for lack of a better word, I think it's really cool that this church father writes and I can take these teachings back all the way to Jesus Christ. Um, this is in Coptic reader. I just pulled it out to show another linkage of a church father um, more so in the Coptic church, um, church father in every church, but like he's in Pope of Alexandria. Um, when we say in the liturgy, let those who read recite the names of our fathers, the patriarchs who have fallen asleep. Um, at one point, we didn't just say that like we sometimes do today of like somebody just say recite the names and then absolutely nobody recites the names. But at one point we actually recited the names. And if you open your Coptic reader, you get to a list of uh, every departed patriarch, which starts from St. Mark, who brings the faith to Egypt and goes all the way down to Pope Shenouda. But if you look at this, uh, number 24, Pope Cyril I, uh, and in brackets beside his name, Pillar of the Faith, Pope Cyril I, AKA Cyril of Alexandria, is a very well-known father throughout both uh, Orthodoxy and Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Like throughout every church, he's considered a father. But um, this is again, just linking back that these teachings go all the way back to Jesus Christ, that this apostolic succession is passed down from one person to the next, to the next, to the next, keeping the faith unchanged in the purest of forms. And now, why are the church fathers important? Um, firstly, they help us understand scripture in the sense of how the early church understood it, um, how it was meant to be read. Like oftentimes, um, if I'm reading something, I have my own predispositions to the world or prejudices or biases, which can cause me, should I just like reflect on scripture on my own? Personally, I have the fear that I'm going to misinterpret something um, and place, um, place inappropriate weight to it in the sense that I might take out a teaching that wasn't really ever there. Um, kind of how Arius relied on the Bible uh, and in the end drives heresy. So I'm trying to protect myself against heresy. So I rely on the church fathers and what they say um, about scripture, many of them writing commentaries on the books of the Bible um, to decipher how it was meant to be read and what the proper understanding of scripture is. Not to say God won't speak to you through the scripture because uh, he genuinely does speak to us through the scripture, but when I'm going to study the faith and study the Bible, uh, to have the fathers there who were so close to the time period of these writings is beneficial and to understand how the early church understood uh, how the Bible was meant to be read and in what context these writings were put to paper. Um, and then just some verses that back up my point that I know absolutely nothing. Um, Isaiah says, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own heart, in their own sight. And Proverbs says, do not be wise in your own eyes, because at the end of the day, if you just rely upon yourself, um, we're all infallible and prone to the mistakes, even to the extent of some fathers making mistakes. But we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, C.S. Lewis, who I uh, deeply admire, also talks about the church fathers. If you read St. Athanasius writes on the incarnation, 
It's essentially um, a book as to why the word had to become incarnated in the person of Jesus Christ in order for salvation to be uh, fulfilled, in, in order for the salvation plan to be fulfilled, and why specifically it has to be Jesus who takes on flesh and dies for our sins. So that's the, that's the premise of On the Incarnation. But in the um, publishing of On the Incarnation, I believe it's St. Vladimir's uh, Press that does it. They have a um, foreword by C.S. Lewis. And he's talking about the entire foreword, why you ought to read the Church Fathers. And he says uh, this, and it's like a number of pages. I just took out a really small paragraph from it. He says, he feels himself inadequate and thinks he will not understand him. He's talking about students now, like students who are trying to learn. But if he only knew the great man just because of his greatness is much more ineligible than his modern commentator. Um, so specifically, like he's talking about students who are going to uh, like books of commentary. And he's going to talk about like students who are trying to learn about Plato. So they read about a guy who's writing about Plato in the year C.S. Lewis is alive in the 1940s, 50s. I don't know when he's alive, somewhere around then. So like these people who are reading Plato through the lens of a modern commentator. He says, the simplest student will be able to understand, if not all, yet a very great deal of what Plato said. But hardly anyone can understand some modern books on Platonism. It has always therefore been one of my many endeavors as a teacher to persuade the young that firsthand knowledge is not only more worth acquiring than secondhand knowledge, but is usually much easier and more delightful to acquire. He's saying, now, if you read the Church Fathers, that's the original um, tenets of the faith. You can go to these modern books by which all of these modern books, because they're speaking of the faith, are going to interpret the Church Fathers or comment on the first Church Fathers in one way or the other, because that's where we get our faith from. You're not coming up with something brand new in orthodoxy. Um, he's saying, if you go to these modern books, it's much more difficult than to just go to the writings of the fathers and read those. Essentially how like, if I'm like trying to tell you about, I don't know, Romeo and Juliet, I think I had to read it in like the ninth grade. I could tell you Romeo and Juliet is a story about two people who uh, love each other and then they both end up killing themselves. And that's like a very accurate statement as to what Romeo and Juliet is. That's exactly what the book is about. But without going to read the book yourself, you don't know all the in-betweens of, uh, it's about two people who, are from, I don't know, opposing families or warring families. So they can't be in love and they're trying to hide their love. And at the end they kill themselves. But first one of them doesn't actually kill himself. He drinks a poison that makes him seem like it's asleep so that someone thinks he's dead. And then she wakes up and she thinks he's dead. So she kills herself and he kills himself. And they both end up killing themselves. But unless you actually go and read the book, you don't know how they actually kill themselves. Not to be like super grim, but that's the book. Um, so, Anyways, all that to say, I can either tell you what Romeo and Juliet is, and you might get kind of a sense of what it's about, and you might kind of walk away with some little understanding as this is Romeo and Juliet, or you can just stop being lazy and you can go read Romeo and Juliet, and you'll figure out exactly what it's about because it's all written in that book. Well, the first statement that you made about Romeo and Juliet, right? Uh, for me, for example, I thought they killed themselves by, say, cutting, you know, uh, with a knife. I didn't make they had a poison until you elaborated more that they took poison. They used the sword. Now we're going into the lesson of Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> they fake they fake their death with the poison because they want people to think they're dead. But then so the first one says, I'm gonna fake my death with the poison. He fakes his death, but then the second, the girl, I think, Juliet, sorry, not the girl. Uh, wakes up and she thinks that he's dead. So she stabs herself and then he wakes up from the fake poison and he says, yeah, she's dead. And then he stabs himself. But like, yeah, you, you don't get all of it. You're right. Until you actually read the book. I made some assumptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. So father is essentially saying that without having read the book, he came to some assumptions of the book, which um, could be accurate in some sense, but also are not the full picture and could be inaccurate. Um, if I just told you they killed themselves, you can think of a thousand ways. Uh, actually, please don't think of a thousand ways, but there are ways um, that may, might not line up with what the actual story is. So I alluded earlier, I was talking and I said, we're all infallible, even the church fathers, infallible being like, 
not all of us are perfect. We're all going to have some mistakes in ideology, um, even to the extent where some fathers hold beliefs that don't necessarily jive with, jive is a weird word, but jive with orthodoxy. Um, if you're trying to think of the most famous example, there's a father called Origen. Not all fathers are can canonized. Not all of them are saints. Origen is one who's um, not a saint because of some controversy in his life that may or may not have occurred, but also because um, he writes, Origen's a universalist, universalism being um, a belief that Origen holds um, incorrectly, that every creature is going to be saved. And Origen writes to the extent that in universalism, even Satan himself will be saved. So this is the belief that Origen holds. We obviously, none of, the, of the, that, none of us believe that, but um, we all know that's not right because Origen's an outlier in holding that belief. No, nobody agrees on that belief and then Origen has this belief. So we don't, know, we don't call him Saint Origen. He's a teacher. He, he writes foundational writings, but he's not a saint. But also I'm just saying he had beliefs that are not correct in some regards, but then he had like plenty of other beliefs upon which the church is built upon. So I don't take any father singularly um, to their beliefs. We rely on something called the consensus of the fathers. The consensus of the fathers, um, this is the bottom quote is per Orthodox Church of America. They say the church believes that ultimately is guided by the Holy Spirit so that when it reaches a settled consensus and the majority of its members eventually agree about a considered controversial opinion, that rep this represents the grace, the guidance of God. But also within the context of the fathers, I have one father saying something, and I have another father saying something, and I have another father saying something. And when I look at that, all three of them are saying the exact same thing. Therefore, that must have been what is preached. That must have been the correct answer. So that's what we call the consensus of the fathers. When I take all of these different fathers and they're all saying the same thing, um, that's the correct interpretation, the correct answer. When I take Origen by himself and he says Satan's going to be saved, that's something that there's not a consensus on. There's, no other, there's uh, not other fathers who agree with it. So that's not consensus. We don't take that to be part of the faith. We don't take that as true. Uh, C.S. Lewis comments on uh, this consensus to some degree in the same introduction I was talking about uh, regarding on the incarnation. C.S. Lewis says two heads are better than one, not because either is infallible, but because they are likely to go wrong in the same direct direction. So I'm not infallible, you're not infallible, but um, together we're going to ensure that we work out the faith together of this is what it is. Like you might make a mistake, but then the church is able to come and correct you such as uh, like the councils you have um, Arius is a priest. He's teaching the wrong faith and the church is able to come in with a consensus of all the bishops who are there and say, no, this is the correct faith. This is what it ought to be. Um, so through this consensus of everybody, we come to the conclusion of what the correct faith is. Ultimately, the importance of the fathers, which I'm boiling down to, which I've spoken um, quite a bit about tonight, is this idea of apostolic succession and this idea of a faith that's remained preserved and unchanged through apostolic succession and through the writings of the fathers who passed it down to us. It's the fathers and the bishops, they partake in this um, grace by which they get to take on the work of the apostles and continue uh, that work and are preserving the church given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, a work which uh, they've been ordained to partake in, if you're a bishop, if you're a priest, um, from now to maintain it now, to maintain it before, it's unchanging onto the age to come. Those are all the thoughts I have for you tonight, but if um, you are interested, these are my resources that I like. New Advent has a lot of stuff. Um, there's also a series called Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture. If you have the, it's called, Katana? What's the app called? If you have the Katina or whatever app it's called, it's kind of similar. Ancient Christian Commentary on Scriptures is uh, a series um, published which takes excerpts from a bunch of different fathers. And if you're reading the Bible, it will take a passage and then underneath, like underneath those five verses, it will have like all the sayings of the fathers that relate to that verse. Um, it's a bit of an investment, but if you have it, um, it's it's very beneficial. I'm going to have a Buna say glory be to God, and I'm going to stop and say one more thing. 
Glory be to God. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Okay, thank you. I'm going to pause the recording. I anticipate there's nobody online and nobody has any questions. Um,